The F-15EX is one of US newest fighter types. Initial operational capability for the type was declared last year and mass production is currently being ramped up, with about a dozen planned for delivery during 2025. But of course the plane's design, despite most of its subsystems being brand new and super capable, is still very much based on the original F-15, nicknamed Eagle, which first flew in 1972 and had initial operational capability declared in 1976, almost 50 years before EX entered service. So this video will explore how many of those original 70s stack level F-15A aircraft would it take to defeat a single modern F-15EX plane. We'll go in depth on the weapons used, then and now, on the sensors, defensive aids and so on. What's the magic number? Watch the video to find out. So a lone F-15EX takes off from a base. At the same time, a yet-to-be-defined number of F-15As take off from their base. While a more realistic scenario would involve the base itself being the target, or some other land target to be protected, we'll just stick to the airfight. There are a myriad of tactical situations that are possible, depending on who is where, but to simplify it all, let's just say that two sides are several hundred miles away from each other and flying straight at a cruising speed. Who would detect who first? A few documents on F-15's APG-63 radar suggest that against medium-sized targets, like T-33 trainer jets, the radar can expect to detect them up to mid-70 nautical miles at best. Though, depending on circumstances, that value drops to a perhaps more common average of 55 to 60 nautical miles. Now, the F-15EX didn't really have much stealth work done to it, or radar-absorbing materials. Unlike the abortive Silent Eagle variant from 15 years ago, the EX is largely a product of existing design produced for export. That being said, even the baseline radar signature for the F-15 is not known. But laden with many air-to-air -air missiles, it's unlikely to be meaningfully under 10 square meters. It really makes little difference if it's 10 or 15. Now, estimating the performance of EX's radar is a bit harder. The manufacturer or users don't disclose such data. But here's one workaround. The F-16, which is less advanced and was exported much, much more, did have its radar advances documented by various radar manufacturers. So the best we've got is this. We will apply the ratio of modern AESA F-16 radar to early F-16 radar to the F-15EX. Initial APG-66 radar, with which F-16 first entered service in 1978, could see an F-4 some 46 miles away. APG-66 version 2, according to the manufacturer, improved that by approximately 25%. The V-2 was similar to early APG-68 radars, late versions of which then got a 30% increase. Then we got the AESA rays. APG-80 was an export-only array, and the manufacturer boasted an almost double detection range over late APG-68 radars. Now, the current best F-16 radar is actually bound to be a bit better than the 20-year-old APG-80 AESA radar, but even if we disregard that, we get some three times longer detection range versus the earliest F-16 radar. Applying the same ratio of advances to the F-15's radar, which is bigger and uses more power, it's plausible that the cutting-edge AESA radar in the F-15EX could detect the F-15A at some three times bigger distance than the A could spot the EX. Now, that's a huge advantage. We are talking about 180 to 250 miles of excess detection range. In a realistic formation with multiple EX planes, that would definitely get exploited. In theory, it's even enough that the lone EX flies to the side, maintaining its high subsonic cruise speed, and gets outside of the A model's search cone, then waits for the A Eagles to simply pass him by so he can approach them from the rear for maximum effect. That way, A Eagles could not even detect the EX nor fire missiles at it, and EX's own missiles could be fired from shorter distances, well inside their effective kill zones. Now, what radar emissions themselves give the plane away? A-model's radars would definitely be picked up by the EX's EPOS system. 
Today's electronic emissions management systems can handle a broad frequency range, be it radar, communication or jamming signals, even if there are signal modulation changes, frequency changes and so on. On the other hand, the radar warning receiver on the A model would almost certainly simply be mum while the EX's radar would glance at it. Technology of the 70s simply cannot cope with signal changes that today's radars can perform. But there are a myriad of possible positions for the yet-to-be-determined number of A models in this scenario. The EX doesn't know how many and going for that sidestep maneuver might ultimately prove to be too risky if there are too many A's or they are too spread out. Which is why we will stick to a fairly simple head-on situation, meaning the EX will continue flying straight forward, having detected a certain number of A models. EX's radar wouldn't be blaring emissions all the time, that would be unnecessary and too risky. Given the ever-decreasing distance, the A model sensors might eventually pick up on the radar if it was on all the time. What the EX would do is gain altitude, using afterburners for a short while, so it could give its own missiles more energy, and to force the enemy's missiles to need to waste energy going upwards. The difference in missile tech would be, as you can imagine, massive. The EX uses D-model AMRANs, which entered service in 2015, though there have already been subvariants fielded since. That's a weapon that has seen almost 40 years of iterative perfectioning. A-model's main long-range weapon, when it entered service in 1976, could have been the Sparrow F. Said model had a production contract set in 1974, with first missiles delivered to the Air Force in 1976, barely in time for this scenario of ours. Now the F-model Sparrow was a vast improvement over Vietnam-era Sparrows. It was a reliable and deadly missile for its time. But it's still a semi-active radar missile. It has a sensor in its nose, which receives the radar emissions that were emitted from the launch aircraft's radar and bounced off the target. So depending on the distance and bounced signal return, that seeker is only sensitive enough to a certain distance. And these Department of Air Force documents clearly state the figures, 22 to 26 nautical miles for a radar return of 2 square meters, depending on the radar type used. F-15 uses a pulse Doppler radar, so the higher figure applies, which converted yields 30 statute miles. Adjusting for a conceivable 10 to 15 square meter radar return of the EX, one might get around 45 statute miles. That's the distance that the Eagle A could conceivably fire its missile from at the EX. One can notice that the aerodynamic range is still longer at 61 statute miles. That excess missile energy is there for various tactical situations, when firing at targets with much bigger radar returns like bombers, or when pursuing targets from behind, when having to fire high up using lots of energy to reach a high altitude, and so on. The F-model Sparrow needed constant illumination by the radar of its launch aircraft. If there were two targets, only one target could be attacked. Luckily, in this scenario, with just one EX Eagle, it means the A-model could, in theory, ripple fire all its Sparrows almost at once. Or several A-models could basically just keep peppering the EX with a missile fired at it every several seconds. But the Sparrow simply lacks range for that. The EX would get to fire all its missiles even before A models get to fire a single Sparrow. D model AMRAM was tested to reach a little over 125 miles. That's its aerodynamic reach against slow and cooperative targets. Crucially, that's also against a closing target and is not missile flight distance. In practice though, Eagle A's would detect the EX just before it gets to launch its AMRAMs. So they would get some sense of threat they would accelerate and not be so slow and cooperative. In theory, they might also get a warning when the AMRAMs are 10 or 20 or so miles away and when they detect AMRAMs radar seekers, but that too is questionable. At such massive distances, AMRAM would be subsonic and invading it would be easy, even with just a few seconds of warning. So the EX pilot would really wait to get a bit closer, as close as he could, without putting himself in Sparrow's reach. Given how quickly older AMRAM C5 loses speed in a lofted launch, even if we assume the current D models can somehow keep near supersonic speed at 80 miles away, 
that's still gonna be a 250 second flight, give or take. In said time frame, both the A model formation and the EX plane would move some 40 miles. Basically, the EX would know how many targets are around it, at ranges of some 200 to 250 miles away. Given the reach of its AMRAMs, it could start launching the missiles at some 85 miles away. By the time first such missiles would hit their targets, the EX would be some 45 miles away from the A models. Hits might happen even before early sparrows would be launched by the opposing side. Now what other options would the EX have? It could try launching at max range, say almost 125 miles, and then it could try keeping out of A's radar's reach, but that would mean literally turning around. Not only would the missiles be dangerously low on energy as they approach the A's, but they would probably miss as they would not get any mid-course updates. AMRAMs rely on course correction for most of their flight, until the last 20 or so miles, when their own radar seeker takes over. So even a small course corrections that the A models would make would over 60 miles lead to irrecuperable navigation mistakes. The best option EX would have is to get even closer before launch, and launch at some 50 to 60 miles. Yes, that would mean the EX would be tracked for some time and many sparrows would be fired before AMRAMs reach their launch aircraft, but EX's chances of hitting them would be higher, with the AMRAM missile retaining more energy. Actually, at 55 miles, the A models would be in theory capable of running away from AMRAMs if they turned around, but as we said, there is no way to know when AMRAMs would be launched and when running away should start. Nor could either side's pilots know the exact capabilities of their opponent. So 55 miles would probably suffice if the EX pilot sees his targets are still going towards him at the moment of launch. It's also plausible not all A models would keep going straight. From the moment their formation discovered the EX, knowing it's just a single opponent, some might try flanking maneuvers at Mach 2. But EX's radar could cover the entire 120 degree frontal third basically simultaneously, so it could provide mid-course corrections to AMRAMs fired both straight on and to ones fired at flanking threats. The EX was observed in Air Force service with as many as 12 AMRAMs. Manufacturer did mention up to 20 are possible, but also said that hasn't been tested and only mock-ups such as the one shown exist. Now, AMRAM efficiency has probably improved greatly over time. Back in the 1990s, it had nearly 60% hit efficiency against non-aware and usually cooperating targets. By 2010s, that increased to 67%. Here targets would not be cooperating, but would not be precisely aware of the missile threat itself. The A models do have inbuilt jammers for self-protection, but against a decades more modern radar in the missile, those would essentially be useless. As long as the AMRAMs would be fired close enough to retain enough energy against a Mach 2 plane, chances are their hit percentage would be well over 50%. Exact figure can't be known, of course. But with 12 missiles fired, it would be plausible 7 to 11 A model Eagles would be hit. AMRAM has a 40 pound warhead, potent enough to destroy most of the hit targets outright, and damaging others so much they have to abort. After that salvo, however, the EX would be in trouble. It would be out of missiles. Now, in the real world, it would obviously try to run away. And it might even succeed, being some 30 miles away from the A-Eagles after turning. Said distance would not be enough for a Sparrow missile shot done in pursuit, with both planes doing Mach 2, even at high altitude. Now, the Eagle A might be faster than the EX. Back then, Eagles did not have the conformal tank option. The EX almost always flies with said option, which greatly increases fuel and range, but there is a structural speed limit to Mach 2, basically 200 knots lower. If conformal tanks are carried by the EX, the A Eagles could then completely catch up within 7 or so minutes, and shoot sparrows earlier, like after 4 or so minutes. The EX does have a very modern self-defense system, including an integrated jammer, but at said short distances, it would be questionable if pure jamming would work against many sparrows. 
maneuvers would slow the EX even more, and before you know it, the A Eagles would be in range to use infrared seeking Sidewinder missiles as well. Given that each A Eagle of the era carries 4 Sparrows and 4 Sidewinders, the EX would very quickly get unlucky, or simply run out of IR decoys. Eventually, one of many missiles would hit, and even without the missiles, the A's could reach gun range. Naturally, many variables are also possible. Maybe A's are near the edge of their fuel allowance, or EX doesn't carry the conformal tanks. Maybe the EX could escape, but let's say it has orders to protect its base at all costs, so it doesn't even try to run. If it would instead continue with its head-on run, even after those AMRAM shots, then it could in theory maybe get another gun kill. That's unlikely, sure, as it would first have to survive a hail of enemy missiles. First the Sparrows, then the Sidewinders. Though Sidewinders of 1976 would perform poorly against the EX going head-on. In 1976 the J model Sidewinder was widely used, and it did not have a meaningful all-aspect ability. Basically, it could not lock onto a heat source unless the view to it was unobstructed. As the EX would be coming head-on, only the flanking A's in the formation could fire the Sidewinders as the EX would be coming in to reach the A model plane in the center of the formation. Due to difficult lateral shot attempts and advanced flares the EX would use, its plausible EX might evade enough Sidewinders so it gets into gun range. But the target it would be attacking would also be firing. So with everything said, chances the EX could get one last kill would be less than 50%, and it would definitely have zero chance to line up itself for another gunshot, with a few more A-planes going after it, from multiple directions. So at best, that 7-11 to kill score the EX had so far could be adjusted to 7.5 to 11.5, probably even a tad less. That's if the pilot decided to sacrifice themselves in this suicide gun attack. Of course, to really seal the EX's fate, at least two more A's would be needed, close to one that was attacked during the suicide run. All in all, the answer to the question of how many A's would be needed to kill one EX is approximately 10 to 14 airframes, with two or three surviving undamaged out of the said number. When all is summed up, one can see just how much new technology in missiles, jammers, radars and so on can influence air combat, even if the airframe design carrying all those new subsystems and weapons is half a century old. Basically 1970s planes would have no chance against the EX in a more realistic setting. Only in this kind of a unrealistic setup, which tests the capabilities of the EX to the very limit, could such old planes have a chance. And remember, Binkov may talk about war, but only real peace can bring us all together.